right, we're going to start up today, and uh, so glad to see all of you here. Uh, looks like we're going to have a full boat again today, and uh, very happy about that. Um, we're starting a new Bible study. Uh, Jacob's going to start uh, First John today, and um, so uh, hopefully you guys can, uh, if you've got any questions, uh, raise do uh, raise your hand. Uh, electronically or put it in the chat and we'll try to deal with it after uh after jacob's done with this teaching all right um i think we'll go ahead and get started and i'll i'll pray and, and get us going lord we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word we know from accounts from other places that the church is starting to in america is starting to be uh, persecuted and stopped from meeting, etc. We pray for those churches that you would give them strength to endure. Lord, uh, give us all strength to endure through uh, these issues that are coming our way, which you spoke about in your word, and we know that tough times are coming. But we thank you, Lord, that we can trust you. Um, that we can put our faith and trust in you, and you will see us through. Strengthen our faith. Help us to be to stand up for what is, is correct in a culture that's gone astray. And we just pray for Jacob today as he presents your word. And pray you bless us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are we all on board? We're ready. We're great. We're ready. Greetings, everyone. Blessings in Jesus. We're beginning a new series this evening, looking at the Yohanan epistles. The Yohanan epistles were the epistles of John. <clears throat> Three epistles of John, one of average size, two of smaller size, but vitally important for a number of reasons, which we'll be looking into. Tonight, we're going to focus primarily on the introduction to John's epistles, with specific emphasis, of course, on the first one, but we're going to look at all three of John's epistles. Let's begin with the background. These epistles are written sometime before John was exiled under the persecution of Domitian to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. We have good historical authority from Irenaeus, who got his doctrines from John via Polycarp, that John was indeed the author. The Lord kept him alive supernaturally to what at that time was a very old age in order to write the book of Revelation. But let's begin with the geriatric authorship of, of John's later writings. John is writing these things approximately 85 to 88 AD, 85 to 88, somewhere around there. And he's writing primarily from Ephesus. Ephesus became the demographic epicenter of the church in the Roman province of Asia. Now, at any time in history, the church, evangelicism, if you want to call it that, and I use the term sparingly, had an epicenter. Right now, in the developed world, the epicenter has been the United States. During the age of empire, the epicenter of biblical Christianity had been Great Britain. At other times in history, it had been other nations. Now, by the epicenter, I mean the highest amount of Christians in church, uh, Christians per capita, the most amount of churches that preach the true gospel, and the church and the countries that sent the most missionaries, and so forth. Now, of course, Western Christianity is in a state of decline. The real growth today is in the third world and in the countries where the church is even being persecuted. Christianity is, of course, in a decline. Well, that's what was happening when John wrote the epistles. Jesus picks up on this and writes further, warning the seven churches in Asia. Um, some of them were okay, but the ones that were okay were like Smyrna, who were very persecuted, or Philadelphia, who was not liked and, and somewhat opposed. The other churches were all having marked problems, even at this early point. Now, let's understand the situation. This is very important. The first Christians believed that it was likely that Jesus would return in their lifetime. 
They believed it was likely he would return in their lifetime. Now only John is left and people are beginning to get nervous. Now the apostles never taught that Jesus would have to come in their lifetime. On the contrary, he warned many would be martyred and so forth. However, people expected something that's trumped about today, the false understanding of imminency, of imminency, that the Lord could come at any moment. Now, the apostles addressed this subject of imminency. Paul addressed it in 2 Thessalonians, where he warns that the rapture cannot happen, the resurrection will not happen until the faithful church knows who the Antichrist is. John echoes this, speaking of Antichrist. The apostles taught clearly that the identification of the Antichrist had to be manifested to the faithful church, to the, at least to the faithful believers, rather, <clears throat> before the Lord could return. They also, again, never taught that his coming would be in their lifetime or, or something like that. Um, but that was the popular expectation. Now all of the other apostles are pretty much or are gone as far as we know. We know from historical records recorded in Eusebius and so forth that Peter and Paul were martyred under Nero around 66 AD. John is in Ephesus. He is the last apostle who's alive of the original 12, probably. Not many of the 70 left, if any. Not many people who actually saw Jesus. In that sense, we can see it as a, in its Sitzimleben, in its historical cultural setting, as a prelude to Revelation, as a prelude to the book of Revelation, his final book. Let's begin there. We've spoken before about John's gospel a number of times, that John does not have an Olivet Discourse. He does not have a Matthew 24 and 25. He does not have a Luke 21 or a Mark 13. He doesn't even have a Matthew 10, the shorter apocalyptic texts or, or predictions of, of the close of the age. He doesn't have what you have in Luke 11, Luke 17, none of that. John's gospel is punctuated with references that may only be one or two verses long concerning the return of Christ, such as in John 16. He speaks about it in two verses in John 16. Or one verse, a prophecy about Antichrist. If another comes in his own name, him you will believe in John 5. It's this bit, it's that bit, it's here, it's mentioned. But <clears throat> there's no Olivet Discourse. Rather, it was God's purpose for John to address the return of Christ later. He addressed it later as the author of the book of Revelation. But he just doesn't jump into Revelation. He begins writing about the return of Christ in his epistles, particularly, well, as his first epistle, which we'll begin looking at in, in depth next week. Tonight we're doing the introduction. So people are looking to him. People are strongly looking to John because he's the last link with Jesus. He's the last of the 12 apostles. People are beginning to get nervous. The others have been martyred. Now the church is growing. It's expanding. But Judaism is increasingly turning against Jewish believers. We're getting close to the time of something called the Bekat in 90 AD, where Jewish believers were excommunicated from synagogues and no longer tolerated as part of the house of worship of the Jewish community. John also significantly would have been written shortly after the events of 70 AD. And the events of 70 AD were a partial fulfillment, a partial fulfillment of the prophecies and warnings of Jesus in the Olivet Discourse. <clears throat> in other words, the events of 70 AD and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple partially fulfilled what Jesus said would happen at the close of the age, and they typify it. This will be a 
Pesher interpretation. A Pesher interpretation. The simple or the Peshet was 70 AD, but the events of 70 AD will be recapitulated at the close of the age. The rescue of the believers from Jerusalem foreshadowing the rapture and resurrection. We deal with this on other teachings. I only mention it relative to 1 John. So it is in 1 John where an eschatological, as people call it, that's a misnomer, be that as it may, the last days in the sense of close of the age, the return of Christ, teaching of John comes into play and begins to take center stage. It is not the predominant feature of his epistles, but it is a major pillar of these epistles, a major emphasis in them, helping set the stage for revelation. The church was beginning to become despondent. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Now, there were things that even John did not quite understand as yet, the final revelation being the book of Revelation, but that's another subject for another day. Let's continue looking at this. So, John begins to address things knowing that he's a very old man and he's the last of the apostles. Much of what we know about him historically comes from Polycarp, who was, I believe, who was martyred. <coughs> Polycarp um, passed these things on to other people like Irenaeus, the pre-Nicene church father, the best of the patristic writers who actually knew people who got their doctrine from the apostles. And we know from Irenaeus a lot of things. Irenaeus wrote in both Latin and in Greek. That's important. He wrote to both the Western and the Eastern Roman Empire, and he ended up in France, but he began in the East. Now, Irenaeus <clears throat> picked up the mantle of John, refuting the things that John warned about. John knew he was going. He didn't know when, but he knew he was an old man. And he knew what was happening, and persecution was looming with the mission. But he saw things coming. And the things he saw coming were not just the external threats of the Roman Empire or of rabbinic Judaism, but from within the church itself. From within the church itself. We know from John's teaching communicated to us that it was popularly believed because of the teaching of John and the apostles that there would be no pre-tribulational rapture. There'd be no pre-tribulational rapture. You either believe people who got their doctrine from the apostles or you believe people who got their doctrine from John Nelson Darby, the cult leader. But you can't believe both. The doctrine of imminency, as we've said, there's a true doctrine of imminency and a false one. The true doctrine of imminency, as we've pointed out, is like in the parable of the wealthy farmer who built the two barns, and Jesus said, you foolish man, tonight your soul is required of you. Can Jesus come at any moment? Absolutely. He can come at any moment for me. He can come at any moment for you, and we should live our lives accordingly. This nonsense that if we don't believe in an imminent rapture, we will not have an incentive to live a moral life is ridiculous. The Lord can come at any time for any one of us. Uh, the doctrine of imminency does not depend on the timing of the rapture. Now, John obviously taught about the rapture, would write about the rapture, but he also first wrote about the Antichrist. And in 1 John, we'll see that when we get to it the week after next, probably. But let's continue. John now knows what's coming, and he's preparing the church for what's going to happen when he is not around anymore. He sees the things that are coming. Satan was gearing up. Satan was getting ready to make his move. All the apostles are gone. They were martyred. I killed them, so forth and so forth. Only this older gentleman is left. And I'm going to try to 
to make my move as soon as he's gone. I'll have a clear playing field. No more real apostolic authority to stop Satan's plans and Satan's thinking. That was the game. There is a historical tradition that may be true that it was an attempt to boil John in oil, but it didn't work, and then he was exiled to Patmos by the Roman government. Be that as it may, things were getting intense with the Roman government. Up until this point, persecutions of the Roman government tended to be sporadic and localized, sporadic and localized in Rome under Nero or at some other specific location um, in Greece and so forth. Now there seems to be, well, there is quite evidently a universal persecution of the church beginning to take shape at the end of the first century, where it will not simply be a local phenomena, but it will be throughout the Roman Empire, which encompass most of the known world. This is a picture of what transpires in the last days. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. You know, we've been getting reports of persecution and the Soviet Union in, in our lifetime, and now in, in China and in Islamic countries, and but it's always somewhere else. Well, it's not going to be somewhere else. Now we're beginning to see persecution happening in the Western, formerly Protestant democracies, who are no longer, in any scriptural sense, Protestant, certainly, and certainly no longer democratic, according to any real constitutional standard. Uh, democracy is going down the tubes very quickly because the Judeo-Christian principles upon which Anglo-American democracy was built has eroded. You take away the faith-based moral values upon which the British Parliament and the American founding fathers constituted our Western democracy, particularly in the English-speaking countries. You take that foundation away and you're heading for trouble. Uh, well, the foundation has been taken away. It's been stripped away, largely. It's even been stripped away not only from government and from society and popular culture, it's been stripped away from most of the church. So the democracy that it was instrumental in engendering, the freedom of religion and so forth, is disappearing as well. Well, this is very much akin to what happened in John's time. What used to be the church is being persecuted there, we have to pray for them. Christians are being persecuted here. Now, now Christians begin to get persecuted everywhere, everywhere. So as we go through John's epistles, we have to bear that in mind, along with several other things. Moreover, once John was gone, Satan made his move. Once John was gone, Satan made his move move. Now, I've stood a number of times on what archaeologists believe to be the location of John's grave in Ephesus, but I would point out that in the Eastern Church, there's a tradition that John never died, that John is still alive, and there are those in the East, I've not heard this in the West, but I've heard it in the Middle East, that John is one of the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. There are those in the East who believe it. Not a popular view in Western Christianity, but there are people in the East who believe it. Um, and they base this on what Jesus said, you know, what if I say to you, there will be some here who will not see death or taste death before the Son of Man comes. And they apply that to John, seeing it as a prophecy that Peter would be killed, a martyred, but John would not. Again, I only point this out, that in the East, there are people who believe this. There are church traditions in the Middle East and in the East that believe this about John. They think he's like Enoch or Elijah. They think he's someone who never, never died. Uh, I personally believe it's quite probably did. I've stood a number of times again where they believe he is buried. But again, that cannot be 100% proven either. Nonetheless, let's move on and look at this. So it's before he goes to Patmos, he writes these epistles. 
Satan makes his move right after John is out of the picture. So the kinds of things John is writing about and warning about are the things that the Holy Spirit inspired him to emphasize, knowing what Satan's move was going to be. We always have an advantage in the chess game. God knows the future. He knows the enemy's moves before he makes them. In and of ourselves, we don't know. Maybe we can't know. But we're told directly about the mark of the beast and the number of his name, the rebirth of Israel. We're told these things are going to happen, that Satan's going to try to wipe out the Jews at the end of the age. And we know what the enemy's going to do before he does it. Well, the Holy Spirit showed John what the enemy was going to attempt to do. Things became so bad so quickly in the church after John wrote these epistles and after he got back from Patmos. It got so bad so quickly once John went to be with the Lord that it was unbelievable. Within a generation and a half, within a 50, 60-year time, things became unbelievably bad. It got so bad, there were so many heresies, so many false Christologies, so many fundamentally and seriously wrong doctrines once John was gone. Now there's no apostle to say this is not what Jesus taught. That's not what Jesus taught. Now apostolic authority is physically not present. It is only spiritually and theologically present in the writing of the apostles. Satan makes this move. It got so bad so quickly that in this apostasy that happened then, scriptural orthodoxy, biblical Christianity, as we would know it, as regenerate believers in Jesus, became just another thread. There were multiple threads of Christianity, <clears throat> then multiple. There were so many heresies and so many false beliefs. Much of these came from Gnosticism. Some of them came from Judaizers trying to go back under the law. But they were all over the place. There were more false prophets than true ones. There were more false teachers than true ones. And at this time, people began writing. There were pseudigraphal writings. People were writing things that were theologically erroneous, but they were ascribing apostolic authority to their authorship. Or the Gnostics were saying, the apostles taught this stuff, but they didn't write it down. All these kind of things happened. Irenaeus, getting his doctrine from John via Polycarp and around the time of others, Hegesippus, Papias, talking about a very early point now, <coughs> in, we're in the second century, writes a major treatise called Against All Heresies. Against All Heresies. And one was Contra Celsum, Against Celsius. Uh, it got so bad that true Christianity just seemed like another school of opinion. <laughs> so you imagine liberal Protestant, Roman Catholic, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, Eastern Orthodox, they're all over the place. It's no longer scriptural Christianity with all of these fringe groups. Scriptural Christianity just appeared to be no different than the others in terms of its size or its impact or its influence. It was not the standard that everybody else looked to or departing from it was seen as deviant. It was just another strain. <clears throat> now that has happened, of course, in our lifetime. This amplifies the importance of understanding what John wrote. Now, Irenaeus comes along taking what he learned from John <clears throat> via the people who knew John 
and he writes against all heresies, and he's used of the Lord to preserve scriptural Christianity. But the essence of that comes from the Yohanan epistles. John generally gives us a compendium, a synopsis of accurate scriptural beliefs about Jesus, the gospel, and Christianity. And that gives the basis for the church to be defended once John is gone. Hence, we have to understand the importance of John and his epistles in understanding how to defend the church in the last days when the same kinds of things happen. The same kinds of things happen. You had this devastating hatred of the Jews that took place because of the Jewish revolt in 70 AD that would then climax in the second century with Bar Kokhba's rebellion. But it was at a time when many Jews were coming to faith. The temple was gone. Levitical Judaism was gone. The Torah could not be kept. The Messiah must have come already. According to Daniel chapter 9, the temple would be destroyed after the Messiah comes. Many Jews were coming into the church, and Judaism became more and more hostile to Jewish belief in Jesus. Judaism begins to morph into another religion called, better called, Rabbinism. Later, Talmudic Judaism would be a description of it. But Rabbinism begins to replace Judaism. And false strains of Christianity begin to try to replace apostolic Christianity that came from Jesus. Again, the same thing now. Many Jews are coming to faith again compared to whatever happened in the last 18 centuries, and you're going to see the same kinds of things. The Bekat Minim happened then, and there's rabbinic dictates against Jews who believe the Israeli government has, has policies of discrimination against believing Jews making Aliyah and immigrating to Israel. It goes on and on and on again. John was not just writing to his own time and circumstance. He's writing to ours. Persecution becoming global, not just local. That was his time. That's becoming our time. So many aberrational sects of Christianity, even claiming to be apostolic falsely. When you look at some of the things being taught by people today, like Andy Stanley or Bill Johnson, or Kenneth Copeland, or Beth Moore, you have people claiming to be born-again evangelical who are as far from the truth as any cult or any non-evangelical sect ever was. Completely aberrational, but claiming, claiming to be built on the New Testament. And it's getting worse. And it will continue to get worse. Now, I said that John encompasses or creates a compendium that gives a synopsis to the church about what they should believe, what they need to know in preparation for what is going to happen after John has gone, but also when these things happen again in the last days, when the prophecies of Revelation actually take place. Well, let's look. When we look at John, he constructs his first epistle in a way that resembles the gospel and parallels the creation narrative. He begins with Christ as the incarnate word. In John's gospel, the word became flesh. Here in 1 John chapter 1, it's the same thing uh, concerning the word of life, as he writes it, okay? Then in John's gospel, you have the light and darkness, okay? We have the false and the scotia. Here it's the same. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, God is light, okay? Then he goes on to Christ is our advocate in chapter 2. 
Christ as our advocate. We'll be looking at these things in the forthcoming few weeks. Christ is our advocate. Remember, it's Christ who's our advocate, not Mary, not Mary. John is in Ephesus. By the fifth century, at the Council of Ephesus, where the pagan goddess Diana of Ephesus was worshipped, Artemis, Mary is proclaimed the queen of heaven, and this whole false theology of, of Marian intercession, that Mary is the co-mediatrix and she's the intercessor. This comes from Ephesus, right where John is warning. No, Jesus is the advocate. Jesus is the one who pleads with the fa Father on our behalf. The influences of paganism get into the church, and it becomes Marian. Then he deals also in chapter 2 with our conduit, our walk with the Lord collectively <clears throat> in relation to the world. How to emphasize, or he emphasizes, being in the world but not of it. Do not love it. Do not love it. Then he begins to speak of Antichrist. Then he begins to speak directly of Antichrist and tells us some very important things about Antichrist and the return of Christ. This is all just in chapter 2. But he caps this off with the promise of eternal life. And the icing on the cake in chapter 3 is the need for believers to love one another. He then moves on past that. When he gets to chapter 4, he begins to speak about discernment, discernment, the testing of spirits. John knows he's going to check out. He knows things can't go on much longer. He sees what's happening in the Roman Empire among the Jews after 70 AD. He sees what's coming. He sees what's happening in the church, and he warns about the need for discernment. As we always point out, Jesus warned about deception perpetrated against the elect four times more than he warned about any other single thing concerning his return in the last days. John goes on and speaks about the divine nature, God being love, but then he returns to the issue of our relationship with the world in chapter 5 and says, we must overcome it. And then he gives the definitive word in Scripture on the assurance of salvation in chapter 5, what the assurance of salvation actually means, but only after he first explains what it does not mean. Now, when you take those things together, the Christology, the nature of God and Christ and of the Word, in the creation, the light and dark, our relationship to the world, the coming Antichrist, the need for discernment, and the way that we should be in our relationship with each other, and the need for discernment. And you put these things together, that is what he leaves the younger generation to face what's coming afterwards. Of course, the book of Revelation happens first before he checks out, but even he did not understand the things that were in Revelation. Revelation resembles Daniel. These things had to be explained to John. Up to this point, John is speaking as an apostle about the most that could have been known at that time. The most that could have been known at that time based on what Jesus taught him and us and based on what the Holy Spirit inspired him to write. So again, we have to understand that we can't understand our times unless we understand his times. We can't understand why he was writing these epistles for us unless we understand why he was writing these epistles for those believers then. What happened then happens again. Or I should say, what happened then is happening again in our lifetime 
the same kind of scenario has come into play. This amplifies and underscores the urgency of understanding these epistles and all of the issues that he covers in them. Now, as we shall be seeing, one of the main threats that comes to the church, particularly when we get to his second epistle, which we'll not get to for maybe two to three weeks, is that there'll be a resurgence of the Gnosticism that he warned about. This mysticism or mystical revelation. This Gnosticism led to false doctrines about the nature of Christ, which is why he's talking so much about the true nature of Christ. One of which was docetism, docetism, but more about these false Christologies as we get to them. Realize there was an incipient Gnosticism already in the time of John. At the end of the first century, Satan was getting in position. He was getting ready to make his move. Once John was gone, the last of the apostles, he knew what he was going to do. But so did the Holy Spirit. So did Jesus. And the Lord prepared the faithful church through the writings of John for what was going to come. Now, in part, this relates to Revelation. In part, this relates to Revelation. Remember, John did not devote a lot of emphasis on the return of Christ in his gospel. But he wrote the quintessential book about the return of Christ later on. The bridge between the two is 1 John, is 1 John. 3 John also deals with what the scripture actually teaches about health and wealth, but more about that when we get to it. Let's <coughs> understand the nature of 1 John and what he is emphasizing initially. In 1 John, the apostle is looking at two problems that have always plagued the church. The problems come from misinterpreting or misunderstanding what is written. And they've always been problems, but they are problems once again, particularly the second one. The first one is perfectionism, meaning entire sanctification, holiness doctrines, that when the old nature was crucified, Christians no longer sin. There are people who have taught this. There are churches who have taught this. This is a very, very big problem. But it has its origins in the first century, and John says so. One of the things we need to understand, and we will, is the word for sin. In Hebrew, you have two basic words for sin, chet and pesha. Pesha is going too far, is doing something we ought not to do, that is pesha. But there is chet. That means missing the mark, not going far enough. Sins of omission and sins of commission. <laughs> Primarily, in chapter 1 of John's first epistle, again, no chapter divisions in the original canon, you have the words hamartino, hamartino. He's using hamartino, missing the mark, missing the mark. One of the things that happens when you get Christians and certain churches and denominations into this perfection, sinless perfection, this what they call holiness, entire sanctification, one of the things that happens is 
they tend to be people who do not, not all of them, but they tend to be people who do not have many theologically literate people in their churches who can read and understand Greek. That, that, that I'm not trying to say that in a condescending way, but I've discovered this. Most of them don't understand the difference that the scriptures place on the different kinds of sin. Um, the first thing that happens is they don't understand the difference between doing things we shouldn't and failing to do things we should, both of which are sin. There are hyper-Methodist sects, like the old-time Church of the Nazarene were hyper-Methodists, who got into entire sanctification. Now, as Methodists, they were supposedly built on John Wesley, and to a degree they were. But in his book, A Plain Account of Christian Perfection, he never associated baptism of the Holy Spirit with sinless perfection. They invented that. Holiness, yes. Sinless perfection, that's something different. So the first thing you see is this. They say, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I didn't do the other thing, I haven't sinned. Okay. Even if you're right, even if what you say is true, First John is not talking about that primarily. What didn't you do? <laughs> what did we fail to do? They are only defining sin on the basis of what they did or did not. I'm sorry, what they did. I didn't do that. You know, I didn't, you know. <laughs> They're not defining it on what they failed to do. Yeah, yeah. I didn't do something bad. Yeah, but you failed to do something good. <laughs> uh, they don't make that distinction, generally speaking. I knew somebody in one of these churches, and the Church of the Nazarene is a good example, but I'm not picking on them. I knew some very fine Nazarene missionaries and so forth, but the Church of the Nazarene has gone so far off the rails. It's one of its leaders, John Kent, signed evangelicals and Catholics together. I know another Nazarene leader, a the theolog theological writer, who was giving out condoms to, to, to unmarried young people in his church. I mean, notice that. The people who get into the most being anti-sin fall into the worst sin. What are they doing? They are confusing holiness with legalism, or they are substituting legalism for holiness. That's what they are doing. Uh, again, the, the they had a rule book the size of the Manhattan Yellow Pages of do's and don'ts for Christians. You can't go to the movies and all this kind of, you know, all this kind of thing. And as long as you kept the rule book, you were in sinning and they're thinking. Well, they get, that's what they did. They emphasized that. And I've seen this among holiness Pentecostals. The women don't wear lipstick or makeup and, it's another issue in itself about what the scripture means, adorn yourselves modestly for Christian women. But they get into this whole thing. We're into holiness. We don't put on lipstick. and <laughs> They confuse legalism with holiness. Now, the legalism they have is not a hard legalism. A hard legalism says we're saved by works. They're not saying that. They don't deny the gospel and that the blood of Jesus saves us in his death and resurrection. They don't deny the gospel. It's not a hard legalism where you're saved by works. They believe in a soft legalism called nomianism. Nomianism. <clears throat> Sometimes it's synergistic. We're saved by Jesus and by works. That's Roman Catholicism. But the holiness Pentecostals and Nazarenes and things, they get into this soft legalism 
called nomianism. And they think they haven't sinned because they're living this nomianistic lifestyle. I don't do this. I don't wear makeup. I don't go to the movies. <laughs> I don't go roller skating on Sunday. You know, I don't do that. It could be a Sabbatarian legalism, all sorts of things. But <clears throat> you see a version of this among the wheat free church, the strict Presbyterians in the Hebrides in Scotland. You concentrate on what you shouldn't do to the point you begin to ignore what you should do. That leads to sin in itself, hamartino. In order to avoid doing things we shouldn't do, <laughs> we first need to concentrate on doing the things we should. Okay. Witnessing, praying, reading the scriptures, fellowshipping, struggling to pick up our cross and walk in the spirit, showing love to other Christians, trying to be the kind of parents, husbands, wives we should be. When you concentrate on the things you should be doing, that we should be doing, that is a bulwark of defense against doing the things we shouldn't. It becomes a trick. I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't do that. Eventually, you're going to do that and worse. I look at the closed brethren, the followers of John Nelson Darby, the inventor of pre-tribulationism. We had a woman in England, was in it 34 years, did not know she was not born again. They sprinkled her as an infant. She thought she was a Christian and she wasn't regenerate. Very legalistic. We don't do this. We don't do that. We don't associate with these other people. Another example would be the Amish people in Pennsylvania and in, in, in Ohio and places like that. They broke away from the other Mennonites, extremely legalistic. Most of them are not even saved, and when one of them gets saved, they get shunned by the community at large. Now, their forebearers were saved. Their forebearers were Mennonites. Their forebearers were truly born again. But they get into this thing, this nomianism, this kind of soft legalism, thinking it's going to keep them holy. But it doesn't keep them holy. The idea is to be in the world, but not of it. Once a believer begins concentrating on not doing certain things to the negation of concentrating on doing certain things, <clears throat> At some point, they're going to drop their cross. At some point, they're going to drop their cross. So the first error you see of people who get into these holiness doctrines that John is warning about is they're confusing Hamartino and Hamartino, Chet and Pesha. The second thing they're doing is emphasizing thou shalt not, but they're underemphasizing thou shalt. <laughs> Then they begin to equate holiness with this legalism. That's the third mistake. This can lead to the sin of party spirit, you know, or religious pride that we're the ones who are right and the others are all wrong because the Amish think this way. And they go on thinking this way, and you find out that some of them aren't even saved. Then eventually most of them aren't even saved. Dangerous. Now, this is not to demean holiness. Without holiness, no man shall see God. It is just to say that the doctrines of sinless perfection come from a misunderstanding of Scripture and a misunderstanding of holiness and how to achieve it. Remember, when you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts or the desires of the flesh. 
I know a church with the guy. I'm not making this up. Some guy prayed, I thank thee, Lord, I haven't sinned in over 40 years. <laughs> he prayed that verbally out loud, standing up in a meeting in a church. And he believed it was true. Well, by virtue of the fact that he stood up and said it, I think that was the sin of spiritual pride. He sinned right there. <laughs> People who have that kind of holiness don't think of themselves as being that holy. The closer you get to the light, the more you see the dirt. <laughs> but let's look further. I talked to a brother, and this guy was a friend of mine, and he was a, a sincere he was an electrical engineer, and he was a sincere Christian. I have no doubt as to his salvation, his sincerity. No doubt. But he was into this... <laughs> holiness teaching because he grew up in a church that taught it. And I was trying to figure him out. You know, I was trying to, I didn't understand it that well then. I was trying to work out how they thought this. And it turns out that instead of sinning in thought, word, and deed, sinning was only done in word and in deed. <laughs> I didn't say any swear words and I didn't, you know, go out and steal anything or fornicate or something like that. Sin was only word and deed, not thought. <laughs> no, 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 no. We sin in our thoughts. We sin in our thoughts. He had to redefine sin to convince himself he doesn't do it. <laughs> this is an endless road to nowhere. And eventually, the churches who follow this stuff wound up in a real mess. And they not infrequently go into some kind of moral debauchery themselves. You look at the Plymouth Brethren as a very good example. Their leader, Jim Taylor, was a drunk and a womanizer. You look at the people who get into this kind of stuff. You look at the Amish in Pennsylvania with the rum springer. You know what that is. They actually have a thing where they allow young people. I, guess, well, I don't know if they were saved to begin with, but a backsliding. You leave the Amish community and you go into the non-Amish community and they sleep around to get drunk and gamble and all this kind of stuff to decide if they want to live a holy life and return to the Amish community when they're in their 20s. This is the Rumspringer. They speak a, a dialect of high German. <coughs> the people who get into this really go off the rails. Have you come into holiness? They see, again, coming into holiness as either the baptism of the Holy Spirit or its equivalent. After you get saved, you come into this entire sanctification. That's how they see it. Now, it is true the evidence of spirit baptism, of being filled with the Spirit, is wind and fire, power and holiness. You can have somebody who can step up and expound the scriptures in a doctrinally accurate manner. But there's no power of the Holy Spirit in what they're saying. Even though what they're saying is true, it's not going to impact anybody. But you can get somebody else, even somebody with a monotone voice, and if they're filled with the Spirit, it's going to impact people, even though their speech may not be dramatized. I've known two really good Bible teachers who were monotones, but they were excellent, and then God used them. Um, being flamboyant and, 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 and being charismatic in a human sense, 
having having personality charisma the way you communicate that's not the anointing in itself god may make use of some natural communication abilities but that's not what it is you've got those who hype it up and they try to use their person like Stephen Furtick type stuff. They put on a show and that's supposed to be anointing. Or you've got other people, you know, who uh, uh, are, are saying true things and they're not flamboyant, but there's no power in it. There's no wind. On the other hand, there's no fire, no purification. Of all the churches that Paul wrote to, the one he had to remind them most about the importance of holy living with the ultra charismatic Corinthians. They were the most carnal, yet they emphasized the Holy Spirit the most, forgetting he was the spirit of holiness, that he is the spirit of holiness. Okay. This becomes an issue, this sinless perfectionism. They will eventually go off into something bad. You see this throughout church history again and again and again. Uh, I'm not just talking about groups like Seventh-day Adventists. I'm talking about people who began believing the true gospel. It is not a good thing. It is not a good thing. It may take a couple of generations, but these groups eventually go off the rails. They confuse holiness with legalism. They get into nomianism. Nomianism. The opposite thing John warns about in his epistles is not nomianism, but what we might call licentiousness. Licentiousness. Licentiousness is based on the opposite antinomianism, antinomianism. Nomianism is wrong, antinomianism is wrong. Antinomianism. Oh. Well, the perfectionists, they kind of believe that the sin nature has been eradicated at second birth. Uh, but these other ones have the idea that it doesn't matter what the old nature does, only, only what the new one does. Uh, today, we have a very dangerous man in the body of Christ. He's the Asian partner of uh, our friend Joel Osteen. I speak of Joseph Prince from Singapore. He is an extremely dangerous man. He is a demonically empowered deceiver. <clears throat> he teaches a doctrine called hyper grace. Hyper grace. It is not hyper grace. It is licentiousness. It is, in fact, antinomianism. Anti nomianism. It is completely false. That we only have to repent one time and then just... <laughs> the grace of God is designed to bring us to repentance. It's not designed to give us a license to continue to live the way we did before we were saved. <clears throat> so John is a, a dealing with these two imposters of spirituality. These two imposters of New Testament spirituality, nomianism and antinomianism. Both are wrong. Both are co-equally wrong. Not right. And both will end in moral and spiritual and theological disaster. Both of these doctrinal errors will end in theological, moral, and spiritual disaster if left unchecked and unchallenged. John was dealing with this, 
and we need to deal with these issues today. We seriously do. Particularly, particularly this antinomianism. Call it what you want. You can call it hyper grace, but it's not the grace of God. The grace of God is again designed to bring us to repentance, not to empower us or license us to continue to live immorally. Now, again, I do not demean the vital aspect of holiness that is contained within spirit baptism. As a young believer, I was saved through a cult called the Children of God. I got involved in these crazy groups, the, the Kobu and FF, and I was just, I had a born again experience with the Children of God. For the first couple of years of my life, I was misled by these groups, but I kept going back into the world. And drugs had a hold on me, cocaine had a hold on me. It took four and a half years for me to get my act cleaned up. It was spirit baptism that empowered me to overcome drugs. Bang. It was spirit baptism. I knew the truth. I wanted to believe the truth, but I was not empowered. The Holy Spirit empowered me. Now, spirit baptism is another subject. I'm only talking about it insofar as it relates to the Yohanan epistles. Yes, power. Yes, holiness, but not nomianism, and not antinomianism. These are bad things. Antinomianism is running wild today. The phenomena of divorce, supposedly saved Christians getting divorced and remarried with no biblical grounds for doing it, not the unbelieving partner left. I mean, Two supposedly saved Christians getting divorced and then getting remarried and coming to the Lord's table in that state and even becoming leaders in the church, pastors. This was antinomianism. This was lawless. Antinomianism ran wild in the counterfeit revivals of Toronto, Pensacola, Lakeland. When these people were told the fruit of the spirit is self-control and this is wrong, oh, you're under the law, you're a legalist. No, you are lawless. You are antinomian. Now understand, before Christ comes back, this antinomianism becomes pivotal in what Satan does and planning for the Antichrist to ascend. When we get to chapter 2, and later in chapter 1, but certainly in chapter 2, John begins talking about the advent of Antichrist. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul does the same thing. The man of lawlessness, the anthropon a nomon, Remember, you're under the law, we're under grace. That's true, but not the way you think. There are as many do's and don'ts in the New Testament as there are in the Old. We've simply come out from the jurisdiction of Mosaic law, as it were, through the example of Israel and the Jews, under the law of Christ. But there are things we are to do and we are forbidden to do in the New Covenant. And most of the moral teaching of the Old Covenant is repeated in the New. They ignore that. They just want to be, quote, unquote, free in the spirit. When you see that free in the spirit distortion of charismata, and again, I... I'm not a cessationist, believe me. But when you see that kind of distortion <clears throat> of charismata, that free in the spirit stuff, <clears throat> you're looking at antinomianism. You're looking at lawlessness. 
I remember when those counterfeit revivals came from Pensacola and Toronto. I knew if these people who say they're Christians will believe this, if they will believe people like Rodney Howard Brown, if they will believe people like John Arnott, if they will believe people like Michael Brown, if they will believe these people, they will believe anything. They're being set up for Antichrist. This antinomianism is setting people up for the Antichrist and false prophet. That's in part why John talks about it in his epistle where he talks about Antichrist. It's the last hour Antichrist is coming. Well, we've been going on for over an hour, but that is the introduction. Understand again to recap. He parallels his Gospels, beginning with the eternal nature of Christ as the Word incarnate, relating Christ to the creation, the separating of light from darkness. Talks about the need for discernment. Talks about the need to distinguish these between holiness and legalism. Between grace and and lawlessness talks about our need to know how to be in the world, but not of it. Talks about our need to be prepared for persecution. Talks about how, as Christians, we should love one another. Talks about all of these things. That's what happened in his day. The same constellation of events come into play in our day. And so we will resume, Lord willing, next week with John chapter 1, verse 1. You have the introduction and background. We'll get into the text beginning next week. Thank you so much for listening. God bless and have a good evening. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Sure appreciate that. Excellent stuff on the background of John. Um, we have a couple questions, not a lot, but if you've got other questions, go ahead and raise your hand electronically. But um, Tanya wanted to ask about your thoughts of people in charismatic circles that, quote, unquote, plead the blood of Jesus or say they put it under the blood, uh, you know, from John 1. What are your thoughts on that idea? <clears throat> Our sin is under the blood. That is true. Our sin is under the blood. His blood makes atonement for our sin. But the way people apply that sometimes means something different than the scripture does. It is a fount that cleanses, but it's not a fount that flows so we can just go out and do what we want and plead the blood again. Like the Catholics just have to go to confession or say an act of contrition or something like that. It's not like that. It is not like that. Now, the blood is the blood. It makes atonement for sin. The life is in the blood. His blood, his life, to redeem us. That is true. But we have to understand, if we're going to use that terminology, that is the focus of what the scriptures mean by it. Yeah. Um, another question. Uh, where, where did the term uh, nomianism come from? Was it a group or person, oh, place? These are simply anglicizations of the Greek words nomos, law. That's all. They're just anglicizations right. and translation from the Greek words. Yeah, exactly. Um, Sarah Leslie has a question. Uh, you can unmute your mic, Sarah. Yeah, I've got a question I've always wanted to ask. Um, when, when I'm reading like John and Luke and even um, Second Peter, they call themselves witnesses or eyewitnesses. 
And when I see that term witness, I think of a legal term. Is that accurate from a biblical, even like an Old Testament standard yes. that you can testify? I was an eyewitness. I am because I felt him. I held him. I saw him. I heard him. Is that is that accurate that this is almost like it's a like legal, legal stance? Okay, let me respond. Um, first of all, we'll, be, we'll, we'll get into that verse <coughs> next <coughs> <clears throat> Next week is in the text, but the basic yeah. word is martyrion, martyrion. Now, martyrion does mean I'm a witness to the fact. In the Hebrew be or, or, or witness to the fact, martyrio in Greek. However, it's where we get the word martyr, yeah. martyr, okay? Just think of you bet your life, <laughs> If you are a <clears throat> martyr, you are willing to be martyred for what you believe and testify to. The Whoa. early Christians who saw Jesus after he was crucified alive again, most of them, most of those 500 were killed for it and were willing to die knowing that he lives and, and they will live. They bore witness to his literal resurrection and that mm -hmm. gave them the power to not have any qualms about dying for it if it came to that. So when a Christian uses the word, I bear witness, you know, it's a way of saying, yeah, I bear witness. You sure about this? Oh, you bet your life. No, you bet your life. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. Another question, please. Must be about tonight's subject though. Um, there is a question from Ayula, and it kind of hinges on today's teaching because you talked about Joseph Prince. Um, the okay, question yeah. is, is the problem with Reformed theology that they take their doctrine from the church fathers instead of the apostles? And can we take anything from their teachings or not? I would be hesitant to call Joseph Prince Reformed theology. <laughs> I... <I'd, I'd, laughs> I, I I would call Joseph Prince deformed theology. <laughs> Reformed theology is essentially Calvinism. It is influenced by one of the church fathers, particularly Augustine. It is influenced by Augustine, for sure. But that was not the first century. That was at the time of after the time of Constantine. Okay. So it did have the influence of Augustine, but it had other influences that came from Islam and 16th century humanism, 16th century humanism in Europe. Remember, Reformed theology, let's call it Calvinism, okay? Reformed theology, Calvinism, is a 16th century philosophy pretending to be a first century theology. It is not a first century Judeo-Christian theology. It is a 16th century humanist philosophy that reinterprets first century theology on the basis of its philosophical presuppositions, if that makes any sense. <clears throat> but it's, that doesn't really have much to do with Joseph Prince. Yeah. Well, Joseph Prince is more aligned with word of faith, I guess you would say, instead of yes. reform. But his his teaching on this this ultimate grace thing does smack of Calvinism. Um, yeah, yeah, he, he I, I would agree, yeah. but not in uh, the, see the difference is a Calvinist would say a real they would say these people were never saved to begin with. Most Calvinists would say they were never saved to begin with. Joseph Prince would say, oh, they were saved, and they are saved. They were saved to begin with. And that's, that's true. true. That's the difference. Yeah. Uh, Eric, you had a question? Yes. Thank you, Jacob, for the teaching today. Um, in regards to uh, First John and the three epistles of John, not his gospel, he does mention Antichrist in three type of ways, right? The spirit yes. of the man himself, and yes. there's one more he mentions that, that I don't recall now, but... Many, many of them. Many of them. Does that does that indicate that his epistles, the three epistles, 
are somewhat as as catalogical in certain areas where we can kind of use that to navigate what we're looking at now the spirit of uh the man himself right and use that to first john absolutely first john absolutely yes okay because um i mean i i would I would think that we are seeing a spirit of Antichrist actually. Yeah. I the- wrote a book called Shadows of the Beast. Okay. And we deal with that very subject in that book, Shadows of the Beast. Okay. The relationship between the spirit of Antichrist, many Antichrists, and then these ultimate two beasts in Revelation 13. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I highly recommend that book as well as. Uh, uh, the, the, the other one on, on Revelation. Um, I have a question from Tammy. Uh, how do you witness to someone who doesn't believe Paul was an apostle? <laughs> well, first of all, there were people in the early church who believed that, and there are <clears throat> there were deists, they were called, in the 18th century who believed that. And there are rabbis who studied Christianity from a rabbinic perspective today who believe that, that Paul was not an actual apostle. My response to such a person would be, well, do you believe Peter was an apostle? And they're almost inevitably going to say yes. Well, then how come Paul recommends and endorses, I'm sorry, how come Peter recommends and endorses Paul's ministry? Or how come you see James and the other apostles recognizing the apostolic ministry of Paul and Barnabas and Acts 15? If Paul was not an apostle, why do the others accept him as such? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I something I've noticed is that a lot of people want to rip Paul's writings out of the Bible because of issues such as homosexuality, etc., that he addresses and they don't, they, they just don't like him, you know? Right. Yes, correct. Another All right. Question. Any other questions? One more. One more. Somebody, somebody want to raise their hand or see? Yeah. I've got a question to ask. Okay. You, you mentioned about uh, as John, Persecution was occurring, and they went kind of they were thrown out of the synagogue. A lot of the Jews and the true believers, yes. obviously, did they meet in the house group afterwards? It sounds like it. So, how did the Roman Catholic Church come, and what truth came in that, and what lie got mingled? I'm just trying to say, was there a gap of a generation that perhaps didn't believe in that period, and how? Okay, the Roman Catholic Church did not begin to really evolve, although it had a few roots of it earlier. It was post-Nicene, post-Nicene. It was after the Council of Nicaea, it was after the fourth, the fourth century. Catholicism was really begun by the Emperor Justinian institutionally and by Pope Gregory the Great, but that was much, much later, okay? Mm. There were people who had ideas that were absorbed into the Catholic Church, like Cyprian of Carthage, who were a bit earlier, but Catholicism was much later. The ostracization of Jews from the synagogue and, and so forth. That was a, at the end of the first century. That was around the time John was writing his epistles. It was or just after. It was called the Bekatemenim. Bekatemenim. So the emergence of Roman Catholicism and the ostracization of believing Jews from the synagogue, you're talking about over 250 years distance in time between the two. So... Yeah. Was there like a gap, or were there believers still in that period? Like, what? Oh yes, believers. Sure. At present, like I'm seeing, there could be a gap further up because, you know, looking at how many people believe, and obviously the east and the west, there's a difference. But the next generation, I just see, are just well, crying, yes. you know. Well, so I'm just thinking, just like Israel, something. <laughs> okay, look, just like Israel, in the darkest hour of Israel spiritually the darkest hour, theologically, the darkest hour morally. There were 7,000 who didn't bow the knees to Baal. Well, it's always going to be like that. It's always has been like that. 
there will always be a faithful number of believers. Well before the Reformation, in England, you had the Lollards, the followers of John Wycliffe, hundreds of years before the Reformation. You had the followers of John Hus, the Bohemian Brethren, over 100 years before, 100 years before Luther. You, you had the Waldensians, the Valdesi in Italy, the centuries. Before. There was never a time when there were not true believers. Now, their numbers may have been small, and they were usually very persecuted. In fact, always. But <clears throat> they were always around. There was never a time when God did not have a people for his own name. Never. Yes. That's Thank very thankful for that, because uh, that's where our real church history comes from, is from those whom the Catholic Church uh, killed, and it's 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 phenomenal when you read the histories. It's it's pretty scary. Um, do you have time for one more, Jacob? If it's relevant oh. tonight, yes. Uh, oops, where did she disappear to? Tanya had something, uh, but I don't see her there now. Let's see if she, uh, she's still here. Um. Hi, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm still here. Okay. Yeah, Hello. Jacob, yeah, I just, I just wanted clarity on the question that um, um, was asked earlier. So the additional question that I had was, in, well, that I put in the chat box was that, you know, for example, when they use the Exodus scripture for pleading the blood, you know, the door, the, 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 the yes. wall, yeah, and also the scripture in Revelation that talks about they overcame him with the blood of the Lamb. Is yeah. that a premise for them to say, we plead the blood of Jesus over Sister Tanya's home? You know, <laughs> when you plead the blood of Jesus, yeah. you are pleading justification that the Lamb died in your place. Yeah, You don't plead it against financial <laughs> hardship. Yeah. Or against deficient right. plumbing, where <laughs> yeah, it's, it's specific to salvation. That's right. Yeah. yeah, well, this is where you get these guys like from mm. Nigeria, like TB Joshua, who set up yeah. shower heads in his church and has people run through the showers to get <laughs> to get healed and stuff. You know, yeah. it's just a complete. It's it's wrong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, Jacob, would it be fair to say that um, that when these people in the word faith movement and uh, the hyper charismatic movements, that when they're pleading the blood, they first have they got a wrong Jesus, you know, the one that went to hell and died for every, you know, Very often, yes. And, and ah. then they have a different spirit. So, Very often, yes. the other ah. thing is, the other thing is. These people do not take due note of the blood of Jesus is represented both by the blood of the goat, which is to do with atonement, yeah. and the blood of the lamb. They do not look at the difference between the two. Now, we have a teaching. Uh, remind me, David, what, what is it where we compare Passover and Yom Kippur? Um, oh, man. Uh, we have tapes on both those, and I'm trying to think. Uh, oh, it was it yeah. the scapegoat? No, no, young. Oh, I'll look it up. I'll see what the I. Autumn, the autumn feasts. No, it, no, but there's one specifically we did about two years ago on this very subject of comparing the blood of the lamb and the blood of the goat of of of, of Passover and and Yom Kippur. Why Jesus had to fulfill both holy days and so forth. Uh it, it's on. It's on the website. I don't know. 